Amen. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Father, we thank you for another day in your grace, another opportunity just to learn your word. We thank you that the entrance of your word brings light. Father, I ask that information today become revelation, that talking become teaching, that sound makes sense. And at the end of it all, we'll be careful to give your name the praise and the glory that is due. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said amen. 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 And amen. Give God some praise. Amen. amen. Giving honor to God who has redeemed my life from destruction. Amen. amen. Giving honor to the pastor of this house. Amen. Pastor Oda, can we give God some praise? Amen. Giving honor to his bride. Sister Oda, give God some praise. Giving honor to my bride, Shelly. <laughs> give God some praise. Uh, to my two children who I tease them that uh, they didn't have my back, but they really do have my back. Adeline and Gabriel there in the back. Give, them, give God some praise. And to all of you, my father's children, God bless you. Uh, it is truly good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, just lean over to your neighbor on the left side and, and say, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. And then now, lean over to your neighbor on the right side and say, I don't know about you, but I came for a word. Amen. There is a word from heaven. For I have received from the Lord that which I will also deliver unto you. For it pre pleased the Lord through the foolishness of preaching to save those that might believe. You have your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 33. Romans 11 and 33. And it reads, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. We're going to rest there and we're going to talk about seven keys to exploring the riches of divine wisdom. Seven keys to exploring the riches of divine wisdom. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And I'm going to start out with some basic definitions here. And the first is that wisdom, the word wisdom is made up of two words. Wise domain or wise dominion. Okay, the word wisdom is two words. Wise domain or wise dominion. Divine means proceeding from God or relating to God. So anytime you hear the word divine, we're talking about God. Okay, wisdom is the application of knowledge, the application of principles, the application of laws, or the application of keys per time. So then, we're talking specifically about divine wisdom. So divine wisdom is the application of divine knowledge, divine principles, divine laws, and divine keys per time. Now, since wisdom is the application of knowledge, then the absence of knowledge means the absence of wisdom. Okay? And knowledge gets to wisdom through the bridge of understanding. In other words, understanding is the bridge that connects knowledge to wisdom. Okay? Now, to explore means to investigate. It means to look into closely. It means to examine. It means to range over. Okay? And so we are exploring the riches of divine wisdom. And we are not just exploring for the sake of exploring. No, that's not why we're doing this. We're exploring for the sake or for the purposes of performing exploits. Daniel 11 and 32 Daniel 11 and 32 talks about, it says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt 
by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So we want to do exploits. That's why we are exploring the riches of divine wisdom. So now, riches denotes abundance. And if we will be honest, just look over here to your neighbor on the left side and say, don't lie in church. Don't lie in church. Because if we would be honest, when we hear the word riches, divine wisdom is not the first thing that comes to mind in this culture and society we are living in. That is not the first thing that comes to mind. The first thing that comes to mind is money. Okay. All right. Luke 16 and 11 says, Therefore, if therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, the unrighteous mammon is money. If you've not been faithful in money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? The true riches is with divine wisdom. Okay? Divine wisdom is the true riches. Now, look at Ecclesiastes 7 and 12. Okay? Ecclesiastes 7 and 12. Amen? Are we there? Okay, it talks about wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. So, one can have money and not have peace of mind. Okay? One can have money and not have happiness. Okay? How many celebrities do we know who are rich and famous, but yet they committed suicide? They took their own lives. Okay? All right. So with divine wisdom, divine wisdom brings with it long life. Eh? Proverbs 3 verses 16 and 17, he talks about length of days is in her left hand, riches and honor. Okay? So, with divine wisdom, you also have uh, 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 give me verse 16 there, if you have uh, verse 16. Length of days in her right hand and in her left hand, riches and honor. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, Matthew 7 and 7 says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So, asking, seeking, and knocking. All these represent levels of interest. Levels of hunger. Levels of desire. You only ask for things you have an interest in. You only ask for things you have a hunger for. Okay? You only uh, seek things you have a desire for. You only knock on doors you have a desire to enter. Amen? Okay. So, now, the question I have for you today is how interested are you in exploring the riches of divine wisdom? How bad do you want to, exp to explore the riches of divine wisdom? How hungry are you for exploring the riches of divine wisdom. Okay? Because think of this. We ask, we seek, and we knock, right? But we only knock on a door to which we do not have the key. Okay? Because if we had the key, we wouldn't knock. We would apply the key. Application of keys is wisdom. Okay? So... That is why Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind, to bind is to lock. So whatsoever you lock on earth shall be locked up in heaven. Whatsoever you open or unlock, loose on earth shall be unlocked in heaven. Okay? So now, when God gives you keys you are now a custodian in that area I and mean, when we think about custodians they have a bunch of keys right they are res they are entrusted uh and they are responsible for keeping the the building that they uh they've been assigned to so when god gives you a key you have become a custodian in that area some of us are custodians in the area of healing custodians in the area of faith custodians in the area of prosperity 
custodians in the area of the kingdom. Okay? So when God gives you keys, you have become a custodian. Okay? That means he has given you authorization. He has given you access. Okay? And he expects application. Okay? So this means there are some things you don't have to pray for. There are some things you do not have to pray for. Prayer is the realm of asking and seeking. But now when you have keys, you are expected to apply them. Okay? Uh, I'll give you an example. If my son comes to me and is asking me, uh, Dad, can you give me a ride to the store? Or can you give me a ride to the gym? And he's, he's, he's asking me. And I say, oh, here, son, take the key. Okay, I've given you the key. What are you, you don't have to ask. Now you use the key and take yourself to the store. Okay? Uh, or it's like, uh, we've heard the proverbial saying, uh, if you give a man a fish, you have to keep on giving him a fish every day. But if you teach a man to fish, then he can go fish on his own. See, when you teach a man to fish, you give him keys of fishing. You give him instruction in fishing. You give him principles in fishing. So he doesn't have to come and ask again. He can apply the keys. So this is where we miss it. Some things we're asking God and God is saying, I gave you the keys. Use them. Use the keys. Okay? Now, so briefly, you know, as I was studying the um, anchor scripture, and it says, oh, the depths. And my mind went straight to uh, oceanographers who go into the depths of the sea. And in order that oceanographers, they study the biological, the chemical, and the physical aspects of the ocean. But in order to do that, they need some tools. They need some tools. Okay. And so if we are to explore the riches of divine wisdom, we need some tools too. We're going to call those tools keys. Okay. All right. And there are, uh, I'm going to give you seven of them. There are more than seven. But for the purposes of this message, I'm going to give you seven. Okay? Now, if we were studying, uh, you know, the riches of human wisdom or natural wisdom, then our natural senses would have been enough. But since we are studying the riches of divine wisdom, then the natural is not going to cut it. We need our spiritual senses. So number one key, the first key, is the key of faith. The key of faith. Okay? Genesis 1, verses 2 and 3. Says, And the earth was without form, and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. So, God did not speak what he saw. He spoke what he wanted to see. Okay? Uh, so faith does not speak what it sees. Faith speaks what it wants to see. Okay? Faith does not speak what it sees. Faith speaks what it believes. Yeah? I mean, Romans 4 and 17 says, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead, and call it those things which be not as though they were. Faith declares the end from the beginning. Okay? Isaiah 46 and 10 tells us that. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand. And I will do all my pleasure. Okay? Now, let's go to Mark 16 and 17. It says, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. It says, and these signs shall follow. And these signs shall follow. The key word is follow. Signs do not lead believers. Signs follow believers. Okay? All right? Signs do not, um, signs do not lead believers. They follow believers so believers have to step out in faith and then the signs follow 
Okay? Uh, this campus that you are sitting in, we had to step out in faith, and then the campus came. So signs do not, follow, do not lead believers, they follow believers. Okay? It is religion that looks for signs to lead them. Religious people look for signs to lead them. But signs follow believers. They don't lead believers. Look at this in Matthew 16 and 1. It says the Pharisees, that's the religious folks, also with the Sadducees came and tempting, uh, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. So religious folk look for a sign to lead them. But signs follow believers. Believers must step out in faith in what God has called them to do. And then the signs will follow. So if we are going to explore the riches of divine wisdom, we need the key of faith. We don't speak what we see. We speak what we want to see. We don't speak what we see. We speak what we believe. Now, number two key is the key of confession. The key of confession goes hand in hand with the key of faith. And I want to identify three types of confession in the Bible. Number one is found in Romans 10, 9. Romans, no, Romans 10, 9. Where it talks about uh, that if you will uh, confess with your mouth what you believed in your heart, that Jesus Christ, uh -huh, if thou will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So the first confession is the confession of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That's number one confession there. Probably the most important confession anybody can make. Okay? Then the second, uh, 1 John 1, 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Very familiar. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the second confession is the confession of sin. Now, James 5 and 16. James 5 and 16 says James 5 and 16 talks about okay it says confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed this is where we fail folks we do not confess our faults one to another we want to keep them secret we don't want nobody to know that we are we are, we are, we are struggling or we are, or we are struggling with some issue we, we, and the devil thrives in secrecy. So he doesn't want you to confess your fault because he knows when you confess your fault to another believer, he tells you the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availed much. So when you get an accountability partner and you confess your faults one to another, somebody you trust, somebody who is spiritually mature, you get that person and you begin to confess your fault to them. Okay, now they can pray for you that you may be healed. But the devil doesn't want that. So he will keep you, uh, don't tell anybody, hush, hush. Hush, hush, keep it on the hush. Keep, keep it under the rug, okay? And that way, he can continue to oppress you with that fault. But the minute you confess, okay? See, the scripture, it tells us that our good deeds are to be done in secret. And our bad deeds are to be exposed. We do the opposite. Our good deeds, we want to expose. Our bad deeds, we want to keep secret. Okay? All right. Now, the third type of confession is found in Mark eleven twenty three. 23. It says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. And so the third type of confession is the confession of the word of God in faith. Amen? The confession of the word of God in faith. Now, the Greek word for confession is homologio. It, see, it means to say the same word. So we must say what God says. Our words must agree with God's words. We cannot rise above our confession. We cannot rise above our confession. Okay? We understand in Proverbs 18 and 21, it talks about death and life is in the power of the tongue. Okay? So if we are going to explore the riches of divine wisdom, we're going to need the key of confession. 
We're going to have to confess what God is confessing. Amen? Amen. Number three key. The key of understanding. The key of understanding. Job 38 and 36. Job 38 and 36. He says, Who had put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who had given understanding to the heart? Now, when it comes to the discipline of scriptures, okay, uh, I'm not talking about any other discipline. I'm not talking about education, philosophy, science. I'm not talking about those disciplines. I'm strictly talking about the divinely inspired scriptures. Okay. Just because one has a lot of knowledge does not mean one will have a lot of wisdom. Okay. Because you have head knowledge and you have revelation knowledge. Head knowledge is information. You can get that from reading books. But revelation knowledge is spiritual understanding that can only come from God. Okay? So, uh, for example, now, if we look at the Pharisees, they had a lot of head knowledge. They were teachers of the law. They knew what the law said. But they lacked revelation knowledge. Look at Matthew 15 and 14. It says, let the, Jesus said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Now, I previously said that understanding is the bridge that connects knowledge to wisdom. Knowledge is information. Wisdom is application. Understanding is connection. Okay? And so, uh, God gives spiritual understanding to the humble. Okay? And... Pride causes spiritual blindness. Okay? Pride causes spiritual blindness. And that is why the Pharisees are blind. They were blind because they were spiritually proud. And so God blinded them that they can't see. Look at Matthew 11 and 25. Matthew 11 and 25. Matthew 11 and 25. It talks about... Um, I thank my God. Oh, here we go. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Okay. The wise and the prudent are those who have intellectual pride. They are those who you can't tell them nothing. They know everything there is to know. You can't give them no new, you can't give them no new information. They already know everything. That's the, that's the wise and the prudent. He's referring to the Pharisees. The babes are the, those who are dependent, who come to God in childlike faith. Those are the ones he will reveal his secrets to. All right. So, number, so we've done what now? The key, number one, faith. Number two, confession. Number three, understanding. Number four, the key of meditation. The key of meditation. Psalms 49 and 3. Says, my mouth shall speak of wisdom. And the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. Meditation is spiritual fermentation. Meditation is spiritual fermentation. Now, in the natural, we understand that wine... And other alcoholic beverages are produced through the process of fermentation. Okay? And we understand that there is the wine level of the word. Amen? Okay? And so, in order to get the wine level of the word, we understand there is the water of the word. Okay? The water of the word, as in, you don't have to go there, but Ephesians 5, 25 and 26 talks about washing with the water of the word. There is the honey of the word. It talks about in 100, uh, Psalms 119 and 103. Okay? There's the milk of the word, the meat of the word, the strong meat of the word. Okay? It talks about in Hebrews 5, 13 and 14, uh, and 1 Corinthians 3 and 2. Then you have the wine of the word, which it talks about in Isaiah 55 and 1. And so, uh, by spiritual fermentation of meditation, we can access the wine levels of the word. Okay, so why do we need the wine levels of the word, though? 
because that is the level of the word that intoxicates. Okay? Because if you remember the day of Pentecost, all the apostles were together and the Holy Spirit came on them. And the people that was observing them said, these people are drunk. Okay. But it was not that they were drunk. They were under the intoxicating influence of the Holy Spirit. So we need the wine level of the word in order to be intoxicated uh, uh, to move. Because milk, milk, you can grow by milk, but milk does not intoxicate. You can grow by meat, but meat does not intoxicate. Strong meat, you can grow, but it does not intoxicate. It must be wine for it to intoxicate. And you want to be under the intoxicating influence of the word. Because that's when you are spurred to move and do things that people think, oh, these people must be crazy. No, they're not crazy. They know they are God. They know they are God. Amen? Amen. So, now, <laughs> we all meditate. <laughs> because to meditate is uh, to think about something, you know, prolonged in a prolonged manner. The question is, what are we meditating on? Most of the time, we are meditating on the problem. We are meditating on the issue. When we should be meditating on the word. Okay? So the key of meditation, if we are going to explore the riches of divine wisdom, then we must apply spiritual fermentation of meditation. Amen? Amen. Now, number five key, the key of management. The key of management. The key of management. If you are not the source, then you are a resource. Okay? If you are not the source, then you are a resource. Now, God is the source of divine wisdom. That means divine wisdom is a resource. Okay? So, now, resources are to be managed. And to manage means to take charge, to dominate, to control, to influence, to govern, to direct. Resources are to be used for the purposes for which they were given. If they are not, then they are being mismanaged. So if God gives you divine wisdom, he, you, he's giving you so you can use it for divine purposes, not for your own personal agenda. Okay? So mismanagement needs, leads to waste. And God does not like waste. God hates waste. John 6 and 12 says, when they were filled, uh, give it to me in the NIV. Give it to me in the NIV. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. This is Jesus after he has fed the 5,000. And they had uh, 12 baskets left over. He said, gather all the remains. Let nothing waste. Because waste is the opposite of divine wisdom. Okay? Waste is the opposite of divine wisdom. We understand. We know the story of the prodigal son. And uh, the word prodigal means waste. And what did he do? He went out there and he wasted his inheritance. Okay? He left the father, which in that parable... The father in that parable was it, uh, representing God. So every step away from divine wisdom is a step towards waste. Okay? So if we are going to explore the riches of divine wisdom, we're going to need the key of management. Okay? The key of management. So we've seen the key of faith. We've seen the key of confession. We've seen the key of understanding. We've seen also the, this key of meditation. Now we've seen the key of management. We are going on to number six now, which is the key of humility. The key of humility. Proverbs 11 and 2. 
Proverbs 11 and 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly, the lowly are the humble. With the lowly is wisdom. Okay? So, humility is a spiritual magnet for divine wisdom. Okay? Uh, let's look at Isaiah 57 and 15. It says, For thus said the high and lofty one that inhabited eter- eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So, uh, there's a direct connection between humility and holiness, according to that verse. Holiness is a byproduct of humility. Humility is the beauty of holiness. True holiness manifests itself in humility. Your level of holiness will never exceed your level of humility. You are as holy as you are humble. Okay. Okay. So, if we are going to explore the riches of divine wisdom, which I believe we have said we all we are all hungry for this. Right? Amen. Matter of fact, I decree a release of a fresh hunger for divine wisdom upon everybody's life, even right now. If you believe that, let me hear a loud amen. 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 So we need the key of humility. Now the last one we're going to look at for today is the key of honor. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. The key of honor. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. Because honor, honor gives access to divine wisdom. It says, wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord said, be it far from me, for them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So honor gives access to divine wisdom. Honor is connected to the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Honor is connected to the spirit of obedience. Because whoever you honor, you obey. Okay? Alright? Because, uh, now we just looked at the key of humility. And now we're looking at the key of honor. Humility, the key of humility is connected to all these other keys in one way, in, in some way, shape, or form. Look at Proverbs 18 and 12. Proverbs 18 and 12. It says, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. And before honor is humility. Okay. So, whoever, uh, uh, hu- honor is, uh, comes from humility. Whoever you honor, okay, you're already showing that you are humble. When you honor them. And you obey them. Okay. Now, when it comes to God, honoring God is the fear of the Lord. Okay. Now, we honor judges. We honor mayors. We honor governors, we honor presidents, we honor chief of police, we honor uh, senators, and all these government officials that we honor, and we should, but none of them is greater than a man that fears the Lord. None of them. None of them is greater than a man that fears the Lord. So, if we are going to explore the riches of divine wisdom, we have to apply the key of honor. The key of honor. That's the seven key. So, as we bring it to a close, we have seen the key of faith. We've seen the key of confession. We've seen the key of understanding. We've seen the key of meditation. We've seen the key of management. We've seen the key of humility. And now we've seen the key of honor. As we bring this thing to a close. Deuteronomy 4 and 6 says this. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people so there is there is no way you operate in divine wisdom that you will not be distinguished because we live in a world that is darkness so if you are operating in divine wisdom 
there is no way you won't be distinguished. Jesus said, you are that city that sits on a hill. Okay? They, they, you don't have to try. If you operate in divine wisdom, you will, be, you will be distinguished. And the distinguished is to so that other nations can be drawn to God. This is why we have to operate in divine wisdom. It's because it's going to draw other people to God. Because they'll, they'll be drawn to the light of divine wisdom that we're operating. Amen? So, and this is our inheritance. This is our inheritance. All who are believers in Christ, our inheritance is this kingdom. And in this kingdom, we are to be distinguished from the world. Amen? And the way, to be dis- the way we are going to be distinguished is we have to operate the keys. We have to operate these keys of divine wisdom. Amen? May God bless you. I thank you for listening. And you know, I'm done. <laughs>